Good morning. There we are. How is everybody today? Good. Man, I am so happy to be here. Um, it's kind of cool because it occurred to me a little bit ago that my first time that I ever got to share a message with this church family was on Father's Day of last year. So I guess I'm just meant to be the Father's Day preacher girl. I don't know. Um, but that's okay with me. I'm really excited to preach on Father's Day because you know what we all have in common is that we celebrate the most loving and gracious bountiful, full of joy, Father, that we could ever have, right? So we're all here as children of God. And, and you know, um, my soul is perfectly refreshed, so I may have a little extra pep in my step, if you can imagine, today because my husband and I got the privilege of getting away for about a week um, without kids or anything. We went to stay with my sister out in Reno, Nevada. She was house-sitting for a family that lives like uh, just on the peak of a mountaintop overlooking the valley of Reno, and we basically spent every single day hiking our legs off. That's what you do when you want to be physically exhausted but emotionally restored, which happened, and when you don't really have much money to do anything else hiking, you know, it works. And so that's what we did a ton of. So my legs are sore, but my heart is strong. And I tell you what, um, sermon prepping on a porch overlooking the mountains in the cool mountain air. I recommend it. It's really good. I got to do that every single morning. So you know this is going to be good today, right? Uh, I really recommend it. I think pastors that live in the mountains and get to prepare in that atmosphere, kind of they have a one-up on us. They have an advantage over us. But it, I tell you what, it was awesome. And as I was preparing for this message during that week, I'll tell you the main theme and I think this should not be surprising to any of us, that when we set aside the time deliberately just to open his word, be still, unplug, become distraction-free, and just sit with him, are we surprised that the main theme I got from him for you today is just how much he loves us? Because I really think if, if we just take time to sit with him and just be with him, that's really going to be the overarching and main message you're going to receive every single time. And so what that means is even though today's Father's Day, and I am very, very aware that days like this can be complicated-ish, yeah? Some of you are going to be spending time with some family here in about an hour that you'd rather not be with. Some of you would give anything to spend time with family that you can't get to. Some of you sit here with a lot of disappointment and you look at other people's Instagrams and think, well, how come everybody else seemed to have that perfect family that I just didn't, didn't get? And some of you are lying about a perfect dad that you didn't have. And so this can be a really, really complicated day. In fact, I was thinking about this as I was praying for our church, and I don't mean to be a downer, but there are um, at least three people in our, our little church family alone that are going through their very first Father's Day without their dad. And that's just of the people that I know. So this can be um, a tough day, and I just want to say this. We are going to embrace and celebrate the Father that we all have in common but that does not mean that you have to avoid or compartmentalize the complicated feelings of the dad that maybe you've been hurt by or that you miss or that you're grieving or, or whatever. Because somehow, maybe you've experienced this personally, somehow even in the tension of grief and disappointment, there's a vulnerable spot there, a tender spot that God can reach in and cover for you. And so I just want you to know you can bring and you should bring all of you into this space. And his love is big enough to cover it, and he wants to. In fact, I, I don't know what kind of personality um, you think of when you think of uh, your dad. In fact, I told Neil this morning when I got dressed, I think I was subconsciously channeling my own dad by wearing camo today. I have never hunted a day in my life. But uh, growing up, uh, my dad was either in basketball clothes or camo. And I figure I look better than, in this than a basketball jersey. Um, but I know this, most of us would associate fathers with words like strength, wouldn't we? Just the general term for father. We associate it with strength and work, right? Like a man works. And so today, we're going to be talking about loving God with all of our strength 
through works, specifically. And I just, if you know me, you know I just love a theme, okay? And so I think it's really cool that we're talking about loving God with all of our strength through works on Father's Day. Bam, that's a slam dunk if you ask me. All right, but our God is a good father, and so I don't know what kind of, like, personality you associate with, like, God as the father. Because, you know, God is many, many things, isn't he? He's the creator. He's our refuge, our redeemer, our savior, our friend. But he is, first and foremost, our father. And our core identity, where everything else springs from, is the fact that we are his children. Before I'm a mom, before I'm a wife, or anything else, I am his daughter. And it's very, very important that we don't lose that because let me tell you something. Whatever your association is with dad, good or bad, it might be difficult for you to understand that God actually has a personality. I think that can be a strange thing for us to wrap our minds around because we think like this like mechanical deity or something without feelings. But it's interesting because if you just kind of like peruse through Scripture when he's identifying himself as a father, you will get maybe a different picture than what you like automatically default to. Because I'll tell you what kind of father he is. You know those like mushy, gushy, doting, happy-go-lucky, I just love my kid, I'm a a fool? That's the kind of dad he is personality-wise, and I know that because of the stories that he tells. And I also know it because of this wonderful scripture that says in John 3, 1, what great love the Father has for us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. In other words, that is your core identity. Everything else is kind of like a sub point and may or may not change. There may be one day I'm not this employee, right? Maybe one day I won't be a wife anymore, God forbid, but I'll always be a daughter. In fact, I think this is like super cool. We don't ever, ever graduate out of being a child. Okay, let me just say this. For all of you with like gray hair, (laughs) And all of a sudden, I just got them like this month. Uh, The calendar knew I was turning 40, and it's like, well, time for gray hair. And it's like every day there's more. Gray hair, wrinkles, you've retired, you don't know your place in this world anymore, empty nester, guess what? You're still a child. Do you know why that's good and it's not insulting? Because when you think about, we got a lot of children sitting in here uh, during the summer, and I just want you to think, when you think about like um, what it means to be a child, like what sorts of words do you associate with like just in general childhood? Go ahead, you can just say them out loud. Like what kinds of words do you associate with childhood or what it, what it just means to be a prototype child? Free, fun. No responsibility, play, imaginative, dependent, energized, laughter. Why can you laugh? Because you're free of responsibility. You know, I just love this. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but a couple weeks ago when we had our family Sunday, I don't know if you noticed, there was one little boy that prayed uh, in the opening, and then there was another little boy, um, Zachary, that played, uh, prayed at the end, And both of them, you know, prayed their special prayer. But when they kind of slipped into their natural real selves, both of them said the exact same thing. And I thought that was so cool. They both said all these mature things. And then, and God, can we have fun today? (laughs) I just love that. I just wanted to be like, yes, can we have fun today? Guess what he wants for us? He wants us to have fun. He wants us to enjoy life because ultimately the world and all of its burdens and righting the wrongs and justification and all of that stuff is his to worry about. So really we get to remain a child and we don't have to be burdened by that. At the end of the day, this is a fallen world and there are a lot of children who lack joy, fun, freedom, have way too much responsibility. We know this, don't we? This is why we have things like foster care and DCFS and all of these things. It's a mark of the broken world. But we can all universally accept that it's not right. 
We all agree when a child like has their innocence stolen, what's worse than that? That's just wrong. Guess how God feels about all of you. When your innocence is stolen, when you're weighed down by responsibilities, when your heart's broken, when you're not enjoying life, he's like, this is wrong. It's wrong. He's a mushy, gushy dad, you guys. And we see this with, with all of these stories. In fact, um, I love, some of us have quoted this verse before, but it's way back in, in Zephaniah 317. It says this. The Lord your God is with you. Maybe you didn't have a, a dad that was around. Or if he was, he was checked out. This means with you in every sense. The Lord your God is with you, and he is mighty or strong to save. He will take great delight in you, and he will quiet you or calm you with his love. Is there anything better than watching a dad calm down his fretting child? And he rejoices over you with singing. You know, when it says he will take great delight in you, this is so cool because uh, the Hebrew word for that is, I think it's pronounced gil. You know what it means? To take great delight in you. It actually depicts someone uh, becoming overtaken by such violent emotion that he picks you up and spins you around. And it says he rejoices over you with singing. That word rejoices, it's like a compulsion, it's a reaction. I'm going to try to say this without a lot of emotion, but it's going to take some work for me. Maybe I shouldn't. My, this is my first Father's Day without my papa. And when I read this scripture, that he takes great delight in you, and he rejoices over you with singing. I can picture this personality. I can, I can give God a personality, which I think is important for us from time to time to do. Here's why I can picture it. This is the essence of my Papa Dave. Isn't it, Neil? This is him. Okay, and so my grandparents were divorced all my growing up. I don't ever remember a time when they were married. And so what we would do is my brother and I, my twin brother and I, we were the first born grandchildren to my grandma and my papa. And they lived a couple hours away. And so my mom would always take us and we would have to go visit them separately. You know, I didn't know any different. It's just what we did. So we would go, we'd spend the day with my, my grandma. But my grandpa worked really, really long hours. He was a car salesman. This should tell you something about his personality. He was a car salesman. He was really good and he liked it. Okay, that's his person. He just had this like big, huge personality. And, and uh, his, his favorite phrase, and everyone who knew him knew this, his favorite phrase was, and he would even say it with this, these like conductor gestures or something. He'd always go, let the celebration continue. I'm saying it just like him. My family would be so proud right now. That was, th those were always his words. I later, as I got older, came to figure out that that's kind of what he said because he was always late. Like, he'd bring my birthday present a month later and he'd be like, let the celebration continue. And I was like, yay. I didn't realize like, oh, he's like two months late, whatever. Um, but he just was that kind of personality. But what we would do is after we would visit my grandma for like the afternoon or whatever, then we'd pile in the car and my mom would say, okay, we're going to go by Cook Chevrolet, the dealership, and we're going to go see grandpa. And it was always like a surprise to him. He was usually like somewhere out on the floor, you know, showing a car or something. And we would walk in, his only grandchildren. And when, <laughs> when we would walk in, I couldn't exaggerate this if I tried to muster up everything I had. I could not exaggerate. It was this. It was this Gil thing. <laughs> he would literally, <gasps> and he even he made up a song for us, and that song stuck for my entire life. I don't know if you want me to sing it or not, but it's just a silly little. You want me, it's just a silly little song. But this is what I mean when it says like he just he rejoices over you with singing. He would literally, no joke, he would run to us. He would pick me up like this. He would spin me around and around in the car dealership, okay, and he would go. My name is Brandy Wilson, and I come from Joplin, no, and everywhere I go, the people want to know. And then he'd turn me around to everybody, and he'd go, are you a twin? 
He loved that we were twins. Then he would go sing the same thing to j and he'd say, it, it sounds silly, but this was my song. This was the song my papa had for me. I kid you not. I last heard that song when I was 39 years old. God has a personality. I don't know what kind of father you did or didn't have. Maybe you longed for your dad to come see you at your ball game or watch you play your guitar or whatever. He, he does, and he's cheering you on. He has a song for you. He calls you by name, and I tell you what his voice is going to sound like. Celebratory. He wants the celebration to continue. Basically, let me just put it this way. Based on little splices of scripture that we see and parables where he depicts himself as a father, this is the kind of dad he is if you just need the personality moving forward. He's a party-throwing, banquet-hosting, dancing, singing, build-your-own-custom-bedroom-in-his-mansion kind of dad. Now that is a father that's excited to be your father. And let's be clear. He's not just happy to be a father. He's happy to be your father. Not putting up with you. Didn't reluctantly bring you into the fold. Do you know how I know that? He was already a father before he went to the links to have us. And so here's the thing. I, one thing I, I don't do everything right with my kids, but one thing I feel like I've done really, really right, and both of us have done with our girls, is I regularly tell them, I am so happy to be your mom. I'm so glad that I get to be your mom. I, I'm not just happy that I'm a mom. I wouldn't want to be anyone else's. I want to be yours. You're the perfect daughters for me. There's a difference, isn't there? And God says this about you. And if you're the type that needs verbal affirmation, hint, we all do, guess what? You could get it every single day if you would open up his word and let him speak. Because it will be always, always love which brings me to my next point. Because see, if we're going to love God with all of our strength through works, that's going to be really, really hard to do if we don't have strength. So, so we need to have strength, right? So in order to have strength, we've got to have, if you're going to have strength physically speaking, what do you have to have? You've got to have muscles, don't you? So how are we going to get muscles? Well, I can tell you by all the hiking that we did, you do not go and build muscles through resistance or strength training without eating first because that's your fuel. If you try to work out and you never eat, it's just going to eat away your, <laughs> your muscles and your fat. But So we have to have fuel. Well, fuel is food, and spiritually speaking, what is our food? The Word, Right? And it's not just something to memorize, it's something to take in and to live. This is something that's supposed to be living in you. This word is the bread of life. And so, the reason that I honed in and took a while to talk about our identity as a child is because if we don't have that first, we don't have our strength. You know why? Because when I look at the uh, Jesus in the, the desert, temptation stuff, where is the very first uh, temptation where Satan tries to weaken him? If you are the what? Son of God. If you're really God's child, you'll turn those rocks into bread. What's the second temptation, do you know? If you're, wow, he goes for this one again. If you're really the Son of God. Two out of the three temptations we're all about if you're really God's child. You know what that should tell us ratio-wise? Guess where, even if we don't see it this way, guess where the core of a lot of our temptations to weaken us are going to come? In our identity as God's child. So that is the first and foremost, and that's why I spent a while on it. But after that, what did Jesus do to kind of rebuttal? Where did he build his muscle there? By taking the word and arguing it back with the word. So we need to know the word, don't we? We can't get around it. In fact, if we're talking about loving God with all our strength, it's really difficult to love someone well that you don't know. True? 
hard to like buy a gift or do an act of service for someone if you don't really know their love languages or what makes them tick or what their personality is like. So we have to know the word in order to be able to love him well. I have watched like um, new Christians, people who, who come into church and, and, and they're all excited about the message and they, get, and they right away want to get plugged into all these ministries and service, which is really great and honorable. But I've seen some of them take off without the discipline of knowing God's word. And so guess how long that lasts usually? It actually ends up usually becoming an effort that is fueled by um, the praise of others, approval of others, uh, self-motivation, humanitarian goals, you know. And those last like a minute. We've got to have food. Here's what I love about food. Is there, e- is there ever a meal, even like a Maggiano's type of meal, that really lasts beyond a day? Not really. It doesn't take long, even like no matter how full you are after a meal before it's like all of a sudden you're like, I'm starving again. Wow. Didn't know that was possible. Another way that we build muscle, we understand this, is uh, resistance, Right? Strength training, resistance, which for us, spiritually speaking, is going to come through trials, distressing times. And so I'm not going to talk a lot about that because we talked about that a lot, quite a bit in this last year around here, but we can just know this. There has to become a point where as the child of a loving father, I understand that if I am going through a trial, That if it is submitted unto the Lord, if I let him do the work in this, in this trial, that he will, in fact, allow me to come out of it stronger than I was when I went in. That this is not something that's going to tear me down for the purpose of breaking me. That if God allows me to go through a trial, it is to prove, A, to myself that I can with his help, and B, so that I can see him in it. It is not to break us down. If you've ever uh, gone to a trainer, uh, I I tried it for like two months one time, got hurt, never went back. But when I was involved in it at the time, it was like the minute it would hurt, I'm like, okay, I think I'm done. And he's like, no, no, that's when you have to press on. And I'm like, what? (laughs) Maybe that's why this has never worked for me before. Um, But he's like, no, that's how you know. Like it's tearing it down. It's rebuilding. This is what God is doing for us in our trials. And this is something that can give us the wherewithal to keep going. Because we'll come out stronger on the other side. But that's just about building our spiritual muscles. You know, resistance and trials. It shows us who he is. It shows us the strength we can have in him. It proves our strength as well. You know, a few weeks ago when it like finally became nice outside, I had Neil bring up the bicycles from the basement, you know, pump up the tires. It's like the first time I've taken a bike ride in like a year. And I'm like getting on that thing and I'm like, yeah, like I haven't even, you know those times whenever you're feeling good and it's like, I haven't skipped a beat, you know what I mean? It's like, and I like kind of ride maybe a little too far one direction because here's what I didn't realize. When you head that way, like toward Naperville, it's like ever so slightly downhill. You know what I mean? So I'm like, this is kind of easy, actually. I might turn the resistance up a little bit because I'm that good. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but, but then it's like, okay, now I'm starting to feel tired. So now I'm coming back. Oh, now I realize, oh, it wasn't just that it was slightly downhill. There was also a little wind and it was like going for me. But of course, guess what happens on the turnaround? It's like a little bit of wind, a little bit of uphill. And I kid you not, it took me a little bit to understand what was going on. Um, No no joke, I can't believe I'm admitting this, but I'm like getting off the bike and I'm like, is this thing broken? Like, what is wrong with it? Something's wrong with my bike. You know what I mean? And then it's like, oh, maybe I just wasn't in as good a shape as I thought I was. Maybe the outside circumstances were just working for me. And I thought I was in good shape. Sometimes we do that in life. We think things are going well for us spiritually. Might even fool ourselves into thinking we've got a pretty strong faith. I'm good with God. But it's actually because like mm, you're in a phase right now where you don't have a ton of resistance. Now suddenly the bottom drops out because that's what happens in life. And all of a sudden you're questioning God. You're questioning if you even believe in this and all of these things. 
God wants to prove himself in those trials. He doesn't want you getting off the bike and kicking it around. He wants you to be able to keep going. He didn't raise weak kids. All right? I, I've got my dad on my mind because it's Father's Day, and I think I've told you before that he was a basketball coach, like my whole life. And so uh, I don't know what it would be for you, but when I look back on my life, my childhood, if I watch my childhood and fast forward and I have a soundtrack playing, I don't know what yours would be. It'd be fun to hear. Uh, mine would be the sound of gym sneakers squeaking on a gym floor. That's the background of my life because I don't even know how to compute the hours I spent bored to tears entertaining myself on bleachers at a gym with sweaty, stinky basketball boys. Okay, That's how I spent a lot of my life. But here's what I know. My dad was famous for um, having really difficult conditioning time before they would even get into practice. So it was kind of that whole thing, if you could get through conditioning, you know, you were good, but a lot of people would drop like flies in those first couple weeks because he would just run them and run them and run them. And it was like people would talk about puking in the locker room like it was a badge or something like this. But I can remember my dad saying, we went to a really small school, like a little farm town, and we were up against people that were athletically better than us, you know? And I remember my dad saying, if we lose because they're better basketball players, so be it. But we are not going to lose because we're out of shape. Because that's a freebie. You know what I mean? Like you can just, you can get in shape and that can be dealt you if you'll go through it. God does not want us to lose because we didn't have muscle. And, and this is how we do it. So we have to know who we are, the children of God. We have to digest his word. We have to, and we have to submit our trials to him, understanding that they are building strength in us. And now that we've got the muscle, you all know this, physically speaking, if you don't use it, you what? You lose it. You can gain all that muscle, but if you do not continue to work it out, it just turns to fat, <laughs> right? Here's what's so cool. God is not expecting us to be physically strong necessarily, although it does help. We all feel better when we're physically strong. But on a much deeper level, he is referring to spiritual strength. So understand this. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, many of us know this scripture, but I want to open, up, open it up to you hopefully in a different way. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Actually means become weary or weak. Though he knows this about us, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly, in the inner man, we are being renewed. I'm going to read that again one more time. Therefore, we don't lose heart or become weary because though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed. I think this is so cool. I hope you do too. That word renewed. In the Greek, one of the, the translations for that means, I, don't, I just love this word picture, renovated. Being renovated in the inner Man, when you think about renovated, like, you know, like flipping homes, HGTV, you know, it's like one room at a time. And of course, what's the first thing they do when they renovate a home? It's like, yeah, you know, it's like, and, and so I, I think to myself, if a house was a person or if a house could have feelings, weird, weird brain I have, but if, if, a, brain, if a house could have feelings, how do you think they would describe the process of renovation? Think that feels good? How do you think they're feeling about themselves once it's done? <laughs> oh, really? You think this looks like an old house on the outside? Well, wait till you come on in, right? That's what God wants to happen to us. That the older we get, we don't become bitter. We don't become irrelevant or useless. No, we are a wealth, and you're going to want to get close to this thing because I can tell you a thing or two about the love of the Father. That's what he wants from us, and he promises to do that work if we'll just do those things to build that muscle, renovated in the inner man. 
In fact, that word strength or might, actually it's the word uh, iskus, I-S-C-H-U-S. And I think this is so cool because iskus actually means, in its, in its most bare uh, bones root word, guess what it means? Muchness. Muchness. I kind of like this. Where is your muchness? Because that's what God wants from you. See, uh, there's something that you have a lot of. If you don't know what it is, you're welcome to ask people who know you. <laughs> I'm sure they'll tell you what you've got a lot of even if you think you don't. Because see, there's this whole thing about loving God with all our heart, like our affections. Loving God with all our mind, our decisions, our choice, our resolve. But then there's this whole thing about loving God with our strength, our muchness, our iskus. Because here's the thing. You are not, get this really with me, get this, because I absorb this over and over and over again. You are not just your affections and your passions and the way you think. You are not just who you are. You are also what you have. Did you get that? Because see, this is what that whole rich young ruler story is all about. Some of us will glance at that story and be like, geez, Jesus. Like, because, because that rich young ruler was an overall good guy. Right? He wanted to love the Lord. He had decided to, and he kept all the rules. And so he goes up to Jesus, and he's like, hey, I've kept all the Ten Commandments, even recited them. <laughs> and that was kind of flashy, I think. And then he said, so am I good? Do I get to inherit heaven? And then Jesus ends up asking him to give everything he has away. Now, that seems really strict, I've been, I've been puzzled by that story many, many times over the years. But as I read it, I realize what Jesus was after was his iskus, his muchness. See, there's something you have a lot of. By the way, I'm the one that gave it to you. And you're not willing to use it for my glory. And so what that tells me is, you may think you love me here and here, but you're not loving me with what you have. That is, it's about abilities, capabilities, accomplishments, areas of influence, resources. That's what it means to love God with all your strength. It's not this. What do you have going for you? Are you really, really smart? Can you throw a really good party? Can you bake a really good cake? Are you an excellent listener? Do you have a lot of time? Do you have a car that works? Do you enjoy kids? Love God with that. Because he gave you a lot of something. And to love him with everything you have, you've got to love him back with it. And here's the big kicker. Here's the big lie that deep down we're feeding on. It's getting us way down here. That we're sure if we give that, then we're going to have less of it. Because that is how it works in our world. If we give something away, if I have chips and salsa, okay, I say that because that might be something I love, and I give some of them to my family, well, then I have less. But that's not how it works with our iskus. In fact, he promises to make us stronger when we use that strength through our works. This morning is my twins, Mia and Ava. They're 11. It is their first morning to serve in quest with the littles. They, are, they were like up and dressed and ready at 7 o'clock. I'm like, you never did that for school, but whatever. And they are so excited, they could not stand it. They wouldn't leave me alone during worship because it's like, Am I, is it time? Who should I go with? What should I do? If one of them's crying, what should I? They are so excited. You know what? Those girls have loved babies since they were babies. They were like the same age trying to baby people. I'm like, it doesn't work. They're not going to like you. But the older they get, <laughs> people don't like it when you try to do that when they're your age. But, but they love little children. It's obvious. It is on them. I hope it never changes. They are running to Quest today. How good does it make you feel, parents with little ones back there, to know that there's people back there that really, really want to be. How good does it feel to know there's people up here leading us in worship and they love it? They don't feel like begrudging about it. This took a lot of work and a lot of time and I love it so much I can't wait to do it again. But see, understand, we all have that. 
And here's the thing. Not only will you not lose it if you use it, that you gain strength, but here's the thing. If all of us were completely surrendered with our personalities, our passions, our minds, and our muchness, do you understand that this would be like the perfect flourishing of a unique body? It's like, imagine a bouquet of flowers that's so beautiful because every single flower is different. Even these tiny little coiled sprigs that stick up that are just kind of odd and weird. But they just make that bouquet look like, wow. Different colors, some delicate, some soft, some just straight up green, you know? Some spiky and coily. But but it's all these different flowers and you throw them in a, and it's just like, wow. We do not lose our uniqueness when we are fully surrendered to God. In fact, you ought to be embracing it and figuring out just how unusual you are. You're the only one that can fulfill that role. So if you're trying to be like somebody else and serve in the same way as somebody else, you got it wrong. He created you. He knows what you're meant for. And here is the most awesome part of all. I discovered something in Scripture that just like blew my mind. I've read the scripture many, many times, but I think this is just so super cool because if you don't know what your muchness is, you don't have to figure it out on your own. God doesn't even want you to figure it out on your own because, get this, I'm glad you asked. A Hebrews 10, 24 says, and you're probably familiar with this verse, let us spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Have you heard that before? Me too. But this like split wide open for me this this week because get this. Let us spur. Guess what spur means? It means to perceive or to discover. Let us help each other perceive or discover how we can help one another toward love, which actually means benevolence or charity. Okay? an outward expression of loving for the purpose of building other people up with love and good or worthy deeds, which can also be translated works. So let's wrap our heads around this. We, one of the things we're supposed to do, we are supposed to help each other perceive and discover each other's muchness, Exus, in order that you can use that muchness to show other people God's love. And that is part of the work that we're supposed to do. How cool is that? This can be very, very simple. Don't keep the compliment to yourself. It's not helping anyone. If you go back there and your kids are in the three and fours and you see one of my daughters, you are welcome to tell them, thank you so much, I bet you were awesome. Because that's going to spur them on. You're helping them discover what they're made for in God's kingdom. If somebody has touched you with their cake, with their card, with their text, with their listening ear, tell them. Tell them. Don't assume they know. Recently, I was having a conversation with somebody that said something to me, and kind of, they kind of mumbled it under their breath. Well, you know how you are. And it like kind of got, I was just like, what are they, I know how I am? I still don't know what that means, and I don't want to ask. But part of me thought like, no, I guess I don't know how I, I don't, I don't know how I am. I, how do you perceive me? You know, sometimes we're just human beings, and sometimes we have a skewed up view of how other people see us. I think sometimes we're more hard on ourselves or self-deprecating than we realize. We all have Exus, we all have muchness. So I think in your notes, I hope in your notes, that there are some questions that maybe you can spend some time with God this week. Are there, are they in there? There are these questions that should say, they're kind of outlining, helping you understand your Exus, and they're this. What do you have? What are you good at? What are you capable of? Where's your influence? What do you have going for you? If you don't know, ask people. That doesn't mean you're fishing for compliments. It means you're going after Hebrews 10.24. You're asking other people to help you perceive and discover what you're good at so that you can turn that around and build your spiritual muscles and spread God's love, which was never meant for you to grab onto and hoard. Nothing is cute when hoarded, right? It's just not. 
We need each other. So call it out because you know what? God knows life is a journey and it is often hard. By virtue of a journey, there are legs of it that are maybe easy, maybe even pleasant with a lot of nice things to look at. And then there are some parts that are just arduous, right? That are just hard. We need each other in this journey of life. You know I'm going to have to tell a hiking story, right? Okay, anybody else here like hiking or no? I have decided I am no longer, like, it's not responsible of me anymore to say that I go hiking in Illinois. So I told Neil, if I say hiking and I'm in Illinois, you correct me. I need to say, like, I'm going on a walk in nature. You're going on a walk if you're in Illinois, okay? Because I, like, set out to hike and I'm thinking I can do it. And it's, like, all up or all down with a ton of rocks and roots and all kinds of things you can trip on. And my knee is not as recovered as I thought it was. So everything took twice as long, but we were determined. So there was, we, we hiked uh, around Lake Tahoe. If you've never been, oh my gosh, God's beauty on display, in full effect. It was so visually stimulating. But there was this one, uh, one kind of impasse that we came to, and there were two trails, literally like the sign that says, like, one trail this way, one trail that way, okay? So we're on the same mountain, okay? And this, this one trail was called Cannon Falls, Okay? And I don't remember how many miles it was. I think it was like three point something or other. And then, then in the exact opposite direction, same mountain, it said, get this, Desolation Trail. <laughs> Cannon Falls, Desolation Trail. I don't know who the marketing person was that named those, but I'm like, how many people do you think is going to take Desolation Trails, you know? Um, so just by virtue of the name, of course, which one did we go for first? Duh, you know, Cannon Falls. Some of you are like trying to be all proud, like oh, I would have done Desolation Trails, but whatever. We went on Cannon Falls. Lots of other people did too. And here's what I'll say. Cannon Falls, Desolation Trail. We ended up doing both of them because when we came down from Cannon Falls, we felt like rock stars. We misperceived. <laughs> but we went on both of them. And here's what I want to say about this, and it does have to do with what I'm talking about today, spurring one another on. Because life is a journey and it's hard, and we need each other. These two trails were almost exactly the same distance and almost the exact same elevation gains. The difference lied in viewpoints and people. So when we were going up Cannon Falls, it was like, it was hard at times. You're like climbing, helping each other up, like kind of scary at times. You're sweating, you know, and all that. But all along the way, there's people. And I would stop and I would take pictures, you know, and little videos, and I'd stop. And people would, now I look back at that now and I realize they were making fun of me <laughs> because I was taking pictures of things that were way less impressive than what we were getting ready to see. So they would come down and they'd be like, oh, put that camera away for a few miles. <laughs> and, and, you know, and so I think they realized, like, it's going to take you exactly eight hours to get up this if you keep doing that. And so we would stop. And even though it was, like, an exhausting physically, the, there were so many points to just go, like, wow. Wow. So pretty. And then you go a little further, and then there'd be like a, a family coming down saying, it's worth it, keep going. So many families would, you know, hikers would tell us, it's worth it, keep going. And I tell you what, guess what that did? It gave us the motivation to keep going. Because they're testifying to something that we're headed to, but we have not seen yet. See what I mean? It gave us that motivation. In fact, I'll tell you this. I even got a serenade at one point because I was wearing a bright yellow shirt and this family, um, it was an Asian family, they complimented my shirt and I said, oh, I decided to be sunny because it's my birthday today. And they broke out and sang happy birthday to me on a mountain. I don't know, I thought that was really cool. That gave me motivation. It encouraged me. Then we came back down, and I'm like, we've only just begun. Let's hit the Desolation Trail. We're experts now, right? And so we go on Desolation Trail. Here's the difference. It's like one trail straight up, and there is nothing to look at. Nothing. Until you get to the very, very top, and then it's a lookout point. There's also no one 
to tell you. Keep going. It was true to its name. Which one do you think was harder? See, here's the thing. We as Christians, we are all on the ascent. We're all on a journey, and we have somewhere that we're going. We have a destination that is described as so mind-blowing. We are going to be in a place where we view and perceive life, God's love, purpose, richness, and creation to such a degree it is going to blow our minds. We can't even conceive it. The best thing you have ever taken your eyes in doesn't even compare to where we're going. But this life is hard and we're not there yet. And we need people who have also been through depression, but God helped them get out to say, you can do this. We need mamas who have already taken their turn, never getting to sit through service with that crying baby and have a screaming headache because they haven't slept at all, going, you will get through this. We have got to help each other out. This life was not meant to be desolation trail. And some of us are trying to get there to that final point on our own, just head down on our own, and that is not how it's meant to be. We have to stop. And we have to look at the good things in our life. Even if we think life is terrible right now, there are some things that are really, really good. And we have to stop and take a picture of it and talk about it. We have to express our gratitude. Because that's the kind of life we're meant for. No, we're not meant for this one. We're not meant to be here forever. And so disappointments are okay because this isn't where we're staying. That would be like me getting disappointed halfway up the trail being like, well, this stinks. This isn't worth it. That would be a ridiculous comment to make because I know that's not the point I was supposed to be getting at. It may be hard. I tell you what, I will say this too. I don't know if this is your mentality or just mine, but when the hike is hard, there's something about getting to the top when your heart's beating and your legs hurt and you're like, I did that. It wasn't easy. Some people didn't make it, but <laughs> I did. There's, some, there's kind of like a pride in there, right? You ever heard a mom talk about how long she was in labor? There's a little bit of a badge of honor there, I gotta say, right, right? We're praying for a Father's Day baby right over here, actually. We are. Listen, Psalm 84, 57 says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. It's not walking aimlessly when you're a pilgrim. It's walking but there's a destination. It says, they go from strength to strength till each appears before God. You know, I had this, this revelation about strength. And it was this. When I think about Scripture from old all the way to New Testament, there is so much Scripture that when strength is talked about, it is coupled with courage. Try it out for fun. If you just Google like strength kind of things, it's like, be strong and courageous for the Lord is with you. Be strong and courageous. When Jesus would appear in the middle of someone's resistance, trial, or storm, he would say, do not be afraid. It is I. He's strengthening them through the storm. But he's also saying, don't be afraid. You know why? This was my revelation. All that we just said gives you strength. But what good is strength without courage? Because when you think about it, you can have the strongest soldier, and if he's unwilling to go on the battlefield, what good does that strong soldier? It's almost sad. You can have the strongest athlete, and if he's too scared to go out there and play defense, what good is it? What good is strength without courage? And guess who else knows this? Our enemy. And so guess what gets a lot of us if it's not our identity? fear. Takes one to know one. I'm actually a very, very fearful person in many, many ways. And God knows that if we can overcome our fear, which he does not expect us to do on, on our own, all we have to do is wrap ourselves in his love and know that his love will cast away fear because if he called us to it, he will see us through it. And that is where our strength and our courage come from. 
And so uh, I think it's really cool. I'm just going to kind of end with this little example for you. One of the things that I fear the most, I don't know what it is for you, but for me, it's heights. I'm very scared of heights. And for some reason, um, in my, the last 10 or so years, it's like it's just gotten like way worse. I think it's because I've coddled that fear. I've known I'm fearful, so I'll avoid that bridge. You guys, I'm the type that gets scared on the second floor of Fox Valley Mall, and I'm not even kidding. I'm like, we'll be walking on the Fox Valley Mall, and I'll just say to Neil, you can walk on that side. (laughs) I'll walk over here by the stores. I'm that scared of heights. I feel kind of disoriented, and I literally visually somehow see the movie of me falling over to my demise. I see it. I'm that scared of heights. And so... About a year ago exactly, Neil and I did this thing. It's called, and it's local if you guys want to go do this. I don't remember what suburb it's in, but you can look it up. It's Go Ape Adventures. It's this ropes course, this obstacle ropes course in the trees. Most of it, you're like between 30 and 40 feet up in the air. It's all in trees. So here's what I decided. I love, 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 love nature. I also love to be busy and do things but I'm terrified of heights. So someone pointed out this to me because they said, well, you love nature, you'll love this. You like to be active, you're fit, you can handle this. But they didn't understand, well, but, but none of that matters because I'm too scared. I can't do it. And someone said something to me that put a light bulb on. But you're secured in there. You're on ropes, but you're secured, so you, you can't fall. And something about that, it was like, Oh, so what I'm fearing actually can't happen. Okay, I can do this. I can do this. So, so we took a day while the kids were in school, and we went to this, and I'm thinking it's okay, and they're describing like how to latch on. I don't know if you've ever been ziplining, but it's like that kind of thing. And I'm telling you, 40 feet may not sound high, but it's like, oh, my gosh, you know? And so we ended up going in a cluster with other people with this other family, I still feel like I owe them a card. Like, I'm sorry you had to be with me. Um, Because it was like, I had to be very, very verbal in my processing through the entire three-hour thing, okay? So love it or hate it, that's how I dealt. And so I would be like, literally like, I can do all things, so Christ just drinks me. I can do all things. And I would do this. I really did do this, though. That's a thing. And so the part that was so hard is you have to stand on these teeny little platforms on a tree waiting for other people to go first. Okay, that's just misery because it's anticipation, right? And then you would get out onto these ropes and you're in between this tree and that tree and you're not here, you're not there, but you're way above the ground on a rope that's this tiny. And once you get out to the middle, you can't really feel the secure thing. I don't know, do we have the picture up there or no? Was it up there? Yeah, okay, so I know, it looks to you guys like I'm really secure, but it didn't feel like it, okay? You can't feel it half the time. You can't feel that you're secure. And so, the entire time we were there, my heart was racing. I don't even know how fast. I literally felt like I was going to pass out or throw up or sob or something the whole entire time. I never got the courage, ever, not once but I did it. (laughs) And do you know what got me through it? These people kind of like, I don't know if they were just like, get on with it, we got to help her, but like they helped me a lot, okay? They would go first and they'd be like, come on, Brady, you can do this. And they would do that (laughs) and thank God for them. But also, I would have to remind myself over and over and over again, what I'm fearing, and I would name what I feared, I am fearing that I will fall and therefore die. (laughs) Isn't going to happen. Because actually, I am secure. I am secure. It doesn't feel like I'm secure. I feel like I'm up here all alone, but I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to fall. I can't fall. It can't happen. I did wonder if a person could die from nerves, though. That cost my mind a time or two. (laughs) I thought, if they can, I'm screwed. (laughs) But... um, But I knew, even if I fall off this rope, basically you're hanging, you know? And I tell you what, this life is hard, but if we understand that the God who holds our life in his hands, and his hands are safe and secure, if he calls us to something, 
If he's given you a muchness, if he's given you a job to do, a work to do, he will give you the strength. You will not fall. You will not grow weary. And here's what's going to help us. What's going to help us is what helped him. He endured the cross because for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So here's what we do. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that we won't grow weary or lose heart. You know how to train a baby to crawl, right? What do you have to do? You have to like put something in front of them they really want. When you think about this, this is very cruel. <laughs> I can't believe we do this. Like a sweet little innocent baby who's never done a thing wrong and it's like, oops, no, I'm just going to move it back a little bit further. So you have to do more of what you really haven't quite mastered. Like when you think about it, that's really mean. That's screwed up. But you know what? They, they can do what they didn't think they could do because of that object in front of them that they want more than they want their comfort. The object in front of us that we want has to become greater to us than getting out of our comfort zone. And if you want an affection for the Lord that is greater than your personal affection for your comfort zone, ask him to show you his love for you. And that will be your motivation because it was his. The joy set before him was not the cross. The cross is what he had to go through. The joy set before him was the idea that the cross would allow him to be with you. So no matter what work you have to do, no matter what test you have to endure, the joy before you is the same exact thing that we're going to get to be with him. Amen? A yeah. couple announcements, and I'm just going to fire through them. Um, Quest, our children's ministry, we give a lot of people some time off in serving, and it's awesome that we get to do that uh, during the summer. We have one slot on August 25th that's yet to be filled. So I would, I would love it if you guys would prayerfully consider, if you could say, hey, on that week, I would love to be able to serve. And then we have all of our, our serving slots then filled uh, to continue the Quest ministry for the younger uh, people. So it's with the four-year-olds is what we're looking to fill. That's August 25th. So please pray into that. You can email my wife, Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, at edgeaurora.com and let her know if you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll volunteer. I'll take that spot. Um, also, in two Sundays, a lot of times we, uh, on the fifth Sundays, we don't meet here as a church and we get to do other things together. Sometimes we church bomb other churches. Uh, sometimes we do service projects. Uh, but in two weeks, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to have church that Sunday morning. Uh, we're not even going to do house church at people's houses, which is what we've done. We're, we're, we would love it if our church in large numbers would go to the baptisms at uh, Illinois State Park or Illinois Avenue Park. And, uh, and so that's right in downtown Aurora. We get several other churches together uh, to be able to take part in it. And it's an awesome time of just worshiping God and celebrating other people professing their faith and who they put their trust in and to unite together as the Capital C Church in the Fox Valley area to do that together. It's an awesome experience. I go there. I've been there almost every year, and it's an amazing time. So uh, we invite you as our church to go to that in downtown Aurora. It starts at 545 uh, don't be late because uh, it's a quick service. It's, it's an hour, maybe even less than an hour, and it's right uh, in the Fox River, and we get to baptize right in there. It's awesome. Uh, also, um, as a church, man, we believe in giving of all that we've been blessed with, and that includes our finances too. Uh, so we get to be radically generous with, with the finances, the things that God has given us. So you can give in the, in, the, in the box that's in the back over there on your way out. You can also give at edgeaurora.com. And, uh, and another thing that we uh, stand for is, uh, is prayer. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe that we get to minister to one another. Uh, and we love doing that in the form of prayer on Sundays after church. Uh, the prayer team will be up here. Uh, if you'd like to get prayer, we would love to be able to pray with you, pray for you, or celebrate anything that you have going on. We'll pray with you for uh, Also, today's Father's Day. 
And what we do is we love giving gifts away on Mother's Day and Father's Day and some other special services throughout the year. And traditionally what we've uh, centered on is it's been some sort of meat in the past. Uh, this year, it's going to be uh, something you put on meat. And so we've got these awesome Penzi Spice packages. And uh, we've, there's a few different varieties that are there. And so you can pick the one that you like best for, you know, meat, poultry, uh, veggies, um, shellfish, seafood, whatever. There's a, there's a few there. So pick one for family if you want. And it's really, it's, it's, an open, it's an open invitation. You don't have to be a father to do that. We really want to bless uh, everyone in our community. So we just ask that you grab one per family here uh, and go ahead and grab that. It'll be on your way out. Uh, and I'll just close this out. So God, I thank you for what you're doing in and amongst our community. Um, God, I thank you for our heavenly father. God, I, praise, I, I pray that today we can honor our Father in heaven in all that we do, and we also get to honor the Father, if we're able to, uh, that you've given to us. So God, let us do that today. God, you've, um, you've given us many, many abilities. God, you've given us many giftings. And God, I pray that we use them today to bring forth your love and the people that you've put in our lives that we're going to be surrounded with today, as we're going to be with a lot of family today. God, I pray that you bless that. God, I pray that you encourage us on the inside. God I, God, I pray that you continue to speak to us as a father speaks to his children. God, and I pray that we have ears to hear what you're speaking to us, the truths of who we are and what you have for us to be and do and to live, that we might experience God through, uh, through each other. God, I thank you for this week. I thank you for the opportunities that you have set already before us. God, we pray that we can be faithful in each and every moment to walk through them all. In your name, amen.